the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, college lacrosse fans? You're watching episode 218 of the Lax Factor Lacrosse Podcast. I am your host, Ted Hoost, and today we are going to talk about why I think Virginia has one of the best shots to win the college lacrosse nas- national championship in 2023. I think they're almost a lock for the final four. And I think that, you know, right now, if I had to pick a favorite, I'm picking UVA as my favorite to win the national title in 2023. And and stay with me here. I'll, I'll provide some solid backup as to why I think that. And you might not think me crazy by the end of it here. As always, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and you can go to laxfactor.com and support us. We have some new t-shirts up here. On our website, we have the Club Lacrosse All-Star t-shirt here that you can get a look at here now. And we also have our Chillax t-shirt, so you can support us that way. Just buy t-shirts. We're going to put out new signature t-shirts all the time here now. So that is the best way to support us. Go to laxfactor.com to do that. Now, let me get into this, though, here. And I like UVA as a Final Four team, and I like them as having a legit shot at winning it all for a couple of reasons. They looked like a legitimate contender last season if you took their 11 wins. However... In their four losses, they barely looked like a ranked team. They lost badly to Maryland twice. They got handled by Richmond on the road, and then they got beat up by Duke as well. I believe that was also on the road. Now, both the offense and the defense, they looked terrible in those losses, struggling to score and get stops at key points when they needed it. The Cavs got waxed in all four of their losses, 23-12 to Maryland, 17-13 to Richmond, 17-18 to to Duke and 18-19 uh, against Maryland in the NCAA tournament. Quarterfinals is where they got bo- booted. The offense, they couldn't keep pace in terms of points, and the defense struggled to get stops when they were needed, as I said. In three of those four losses, it's worth noting P.D. Lasala was either absent or not playing. He got hurt against R- Richmond after going 9 of 10 to start out that game, and then Gable Braun came in and finished that game 11-23, and and that's when Richmond kind of mounted their comeback and ended up winning that game. I, well, what did I say? Seven 17 to 13, and uh, he was 14, 15 of 45 in both outings against Maryland uh, combined, which is not very good. Weirman owned Lasala in both of those meetings, and then he did play great against Duke in that loss, so there's no you know explanation for that one. I think he was 61% against Duke in that loss. They just couldn't do anything offensively or defensively in that one. Despite all of the above, I like their chances of advancing to the Final Four in 2023 because I honestly believe they're going to be better at every position overall. When you look at the difference between Maryland with Jared Bernhardt in 2021 and Maryland without Jared Bernhardt in 2023, despite losing a Twarton winner, there was no question Maryland was a better team offensively last year. And you didn't need, I thought last year with Maryland, it was going to take some time for them to get into the offensive flow. It did not. They were a better offensive team, oddly enough, without Jared Bernhardt, just because the depth had all improved. Everybody bought in. And I think that we're going to see a similar thing here with Mar- uh, with Virginia this year. Granted, they didn't lose a uh, Heisman or a Twarton winner uh, by any means, but you know, in losing Matt Moore on the offense is the big loss here on the offensive side of the ball for them. But they bring pretty much everybody back, and I think that they're going to gel a little bit better offensively. I think they'll share the ball a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more effectively. Uh, Matt Moore had a tendency of being a do-or-die Dodger, which is great when you need a goal, but I believe last season I had chronicled in a couple of their losses, Matt Moore shot the rock terribly, and I don't think you're going to see anybody that has that low of a shooting percentage on the team in this upcoming season, or at least they hope so. Maybe Garno, but we'll talk about that. So that's one of the things. And then uh, we'll get into it here. I think, like I said, offensively, I think they're going to be better. So let's talk about the very first player and one of the reasons I think that they're go- they're one of my favorites here for making the final four and for winning it all. And it's none other here than Connor Schellenberger. I think he's perhaps the most complete player in all of division one lacrosse in 2021, 37 goals, 42 helpers for 79 points off 87 shots, 42.5% shooting 34 GBs and 21 turnovers over 18 games. That was in 2021 in 2022. And they won the title in 2021 in 2022, 32 goals, 44 helpers for 76 points played a couple less games though, overall 
89 shots, 36% shooting. It's expected that his shooting percentage would go down with the added attention that he was given uh, in 2022 over 2021. 24 ground balls, 22 turnovers in 16 games or whatnot. So his production overall, probably a little bit better despite fewer points because he played two less games. Um, But, you know, what are you going to do? In that 2021 season, he won the Natty over Maryland, scored four goals, two assists off seven shots with two ground balls in that game. He was absolutely off the charts. Incredible. In 2022, not so much. He lost to Maryland in the NCAA quarters. No points off five shots. Only game all season that he finished with less than three points. And he put up the big zero, the big boner. Or should a boner be one? Technically, I'm not sure. We'll have to we'll have to really dissect that to figure out what's right. Career numbers: 69 goals, 86 assists, 155 points off 176 shots, with a 39.2 percent shooting percentage, 58 GBs to 43 turnovers. A guy; those are just incredible statistics over his first two seasons here, as good as anyone. Schellenberger, as a player, some attributes: he has almost zero weakness. To his game, that is just a fact. He is a great dodger, doesn't beat you with blinding speed, but he has next-level IQ and field awareness, and he knows when to dodge or to die. You know, he knows when when is a good time to go, when is it time for a, just a solid do-or-dodge die, but at least it's the best time to try that do-or-dodge do or die dodge. And by do or die dodge, I mean you're going to the rack hard. You're going to dodge. You're going to re-dodge. You're doing everything you can. Very a la Matt Moore uh, or Michael Krause was one of the best do or die dodgers I've ever seen in a sport of college across. The dude was just an absolute beast of a dodger in terms of just once he decides I'm going to the rack and I'm getting there, he'd actually get there. And Moore was very much like that. Not quite as efficient, I think, as Krause was. Um, But overall, you know, he knows when to go. He knows when to poke and pod that or poke, poke and prod that defense until it cracks. And his IQ is just next level overall. He's an excellent shooter. He can bring the smoke, albeit he's not going to win the fastest shot contest in the NCAA, but he can bring the heat with his shot. More importantly, though, he's accurate. He has a quick release and he has the ability to find space when he needs it, both with the ball and and without. Not only is this dude a quarterback of an offense and extremely effective in that manner, but he can play, he can do everything. The kid is a complete player. Even if you're not going to see him play a lot off ball, you know, in transition and in, in scenarios where man up plays, where it would dictate, hey, find some space and get a shot off, he can absolutely do that. And with the, with shuts here looking like he may get to take over a little bit of the X duties away from Schellenberger and be kind of a Dodger scorer feeder from back there, that could free Schellenberger up to play that wing a little bit more and get a lot more shots, time and room shots off that wing. I would love to see that. Great in transition as both a feeder and a finisher. Give him any situation where a defense isn't set, whether it be a quick restart, fast break, whatever. He'll make the defense pay by taking what they give him. He's not going to do too much. He's not going to overpress, but he's going to be as aggressive as you can right up to that line of that point of no return, at which point he'd back off. Deadly as an initiator from X uh, will spot feed. Uh, and anyone that's open on the crease or wings or whatnot, while he's at GLE, they have vested interest in moving and getting moving because there's a potential goal there when he is at X. But like I said, he's also really solid dodging and playing on that wing area and with shuts, Connor, some uh, Dixon, some other guys that are capable at playing at X, getting some of that that burn, whether they're playing from the attack spot or midfield inverting, that's going to free Schellenberger up a lot, I think, and take a little bit of pressure off him as a dodger and as a creator for this offense because all of these guys are a year deeper and a little bit more formidable. Boom. All right, Peyton Cormier. He is the next guy that we have to talk about over overall. And listen, the Schellenberger to Cormier connection, and it might even go Cormier to Schellenberger at times connection, it's going to be way too much overall for teams. Not that Cormier can't create his own offense because he can, and he can use his sides to kind of try to dodge in to the middle of the field from that left wing is what he really likes to do. He could go down the alley, but I've noticed he prefers to kind of get into the middle of the field and will just wear people down bulldozing his way to get a shot off. That's great. And uh, he can make it look easy to boot. You know, you're like, hey, man, why isn't this guy dodging more often? But that's partly because he knows when a good time to go is when the help's not there. If he can kind of dodge over top of the defense and just try to use his size to get that edge, he's going to take it. And he's not going to be a huge turnover risk in that way. But when teamed up with Shelly, 
Cormier, he's free to find spots all over the field, particularly that left wing, especially in transition. It's almost one of those situations where you, you've you got to pick your poison. Never let Peyton Cormier get the ball in transition on the left side of that field, especially from anywhere near 10 yards. He is going to absolutely smoke your goalkeeper, and it's going to be terrible. He will feast until he's fat and sassy on that left wing in transition and in man-up situations. 2021, 45 goals, 8 helpers, 53 points off 110 shots 40.9 percent shooting with eight man up goals 2022 50 goals 10 helpers 60 points off 122 shots his shooting percentage actually went up in 2022 41 percent three man up goals 33 gbs 21 turnovers all that crap uh in 2021 he had two goals in the national championship win over maryland off just two shots not too shabby 2022 two goals and a dish off three shots in their loss to maryland in the quarterfinals. Now, as we look at his attributes, I've kind of already talked about him, so I might kind of repeat a couple of these. Beast of a finisher, though. Goalies consider him a monster. You're going to hear defenses and goaltenders yell shooter, shooter, shooter every time the ball is in the area of Cormier. Uh, one of the best shooters in the sport at all levels, I think. He brings the heat, total smoke show, but has the finesse of a freaking ballerina. In terms of his accuracy overall, uh, if said ballerina was six foot two, two hundred and thirty pounds, you have to respect him anytime he's camping out anywhere on that backside, either on the left wing or hanging out at top. He'll play a lot of high crease when things are inverted, and he's not afraid at all once that that kind of play breaks down and he's not open on the backside to then be a cutter, become a cutter and cut right down the middle of the defense. He's not quite Mac O'Keefe in terms of getting open. Mac O'Keefe was one of the best off-ball attackman that I have ever seen in all of my years of watching lacrosse in terms of just running off curls, picks, um, playing the two-man game, finding space, being a cutter, sometimes having to dodge as a two-man dodge off a, a, a dodge that maybe drew some help so he could get to the rack with... I mean, Mac O'Keefe was next level. Cormier isn't that guy, but he's like... You know, Mac O'Keefe light in terms of just being able to find soft spots, get open, has incredible hands uh, so he can finish in close and then he can just smoke goalkeepers beyond that. He, and like I said, he can beat you carrying the rock as well, specifically from the wing into the middle of the defense, especially if he gets a chance to go over top. What I think you'll see a lot of teams do to him in 2023 is not ever give him that inside and maybe start trying to force him down that right alley a little bit more, make him try to pull that underneath dodge down there. So if he can work that into his repertoire as teams are trying to take that middle of the field away from him, forget about it, man. It's going to be, it's going to be in dangerous, dangerous to say the least. So to be clear, Shelly and Cormier connection, it's going to be bonkers in 2023, and they will for sure be one of the top three, I'd say, dynamic duos in the country, if not the best dynamic duo in the country overall in terms of just a one-two punch at attack. But there's other guys, other guys on this UVA roster that make me believe this offense might end up being special, similar to kind of how you see Maryland's team progress from being a team led by Bernhardt to being a team led by Everybody, you know, in turn, and granted, we had we had definite um, uh, uh, leaders on that team in terms of like the Maryland top three. But you saw efficient scoring going all the way down that roster. And I think that we might see something like that for Virginia. So the next guy that I want to talk about, Xander Dixon, always been talented, but due to a loaded roster, he was kind of just stuck you know, too far down that roster in terms of options for UVA. He was their ninth leading scorer in 2021. He had 10 goals, 10 helpers, 20 points off, 24 shots, 41.3% shooting, 15 GBs, 11 turnovers overall. Those 11 turnovers are a little high considering the playing time and point totals. Although he got a lot of burn, you know, that that's a little bit too high there. Saw a huge bump, though, overall in both burn and production in 2022. He ends up being UVA's fourth leading scorer behind Schellenberger, Cormier, and more. Last year, he even fraud uh, frog jumped Connor, who scored more than him in 2021. 2022, we saw 31 goals, eight helpers, 39 points off 75 shots and 41.3% shooting, 20 GBs, 15 turnovers, but 15 turnovers with as much as he played and handled the rock in 2022 is a huge improvement overall. He played 16 games with 14 starts on that first midline. Very efficient when carrying the ball overall. Not a huge turnover risk as long as he doesn't get himself too deep into said dodge, which he was much better about last year. 
a more proficient leader, uh, feeder, a more proficient feeder than his 2022 stats would indicate. But the makeup of last year's team had him playing a ton off ball, and he excelled in that in that role overall. Make no mistake, though, he can carry the rock if he's called upon to generate offense for himself or teammates. But and, you know, he's just he's like Schellenberger in the sense that he will take what the teams give him, and he did an incredible job being patient, playing within the flow of the game, playing within his you know playing in a way that made all of his best traits stand out while a lot of his bad traits didn't. Uh, His shooting percentage, though, which I love, 43.7%. That is absolutely incredible for a shooter, and that that shooting percentage has stayed right in there. I think it even improved from 2021 to 2022. Actually, it was dead. dead, It was the same. So 43.7%. So credit his IQ and his ability to get open out front on the crease off that backside. He's very good at kind of fading and using that backside to backdoor cut his 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 um defender high to low from the crease area. So, watch out for this kid. I think he's going to have a big 2023 season. Now, the other guy, and it's it's a fact that this guy too, as long as he's healthy and all these guys are healthy, they're going to have big seasons is Jeff Connor. Yet another triple threat for this offense, a do anything type midfielder. I actually thought at one point depending on how the attack Shook out. He played so much from behind the cage last year. I wouldn't have been surprised to see him move down to attack just because he's a senior leader that can kind of do everything. Uh, In 2021, 14 goals, 8 helpers, 22 points off 30 shots, 46.7% shooting with 23 GBs. 2022, he goes 14 and 18 with 32 points off 43 shots, 32.6% shooting, 14 GBs. Was called upon, like I said, quite a bit to carry the rock in 2022 after they lost Docs Aiken at that mid field, one of the top initiators for this offense in 2022. Took him a bit of time, I think, to get some confidence as he got used to the Cavs needing to lean on him a little bit more. Over his first six games in 2022, nine points, only a point and a half a game. Over his final seven games, 23 points, 3.2 points per game. Now, he did miss the Towson, Cuse, and Hopkins games last year before he returned. So he may have been, you know, having, he might have had a nagging injury over the course of those first six games. And maybe that would indicate, you know, maybe that would tell a story as to why his point total was lower. But he definitely came into his own in that second season and looked like one of the best midfielders in the country uh, over the course of those last uh, seven games that he played. Uh, uh, let's see here. And that's it. You know, really, I think that you're going to see him do a lot more initiating from uh, a lot of initiating from X once again in 2023. I think that you'll probably see the goal assist ratio stay close to that 50 50 type guy. And that's exactly the type of role they need him to play. And he'll do that well. Next guy that we have to talk about here. And I'm excited about this guy here is Griffin Schutz. Now, he's a damn beast, six foot three, 220 pounds, a man among boys, whether he runs for mid or attack. Now, I've heard it looks like he's running attack so far this fall in the scrimmage that saw Cormier not playing. He ran attack and he initiated from X a ton. It made it sound like they had Schellenberger working that wing a lot more so far in that first those first couple of scrimmages. That Terry, I think it was Terry Foy uh, from Inside Lacrosse that did a great job reporting on all that stuff. Uh, make sure you find Terry Foy on Twitter, especially for fall ball. I think this is the best that anyone inside lacrosse and even other organizations are doing in terms of covering fall ball and getting information about the scrimmages out there. So credit to those guys. They've done a great job. But uh, So it does look like he's going to be able to kind of be a big initiator on that attack from X even, which I was surprised. I honestly thought you may end up seeing him up on that right wing with Shelly at X, but apparently not. So that's a big deal. 2022, 23 goals, 7 helpers, 30 points off, 67 shots, 34.3% shooting. I think he'll stay above 30%, but I think you'll see that shooting percentage drop a little bit just because more time, more burn, more attention as one of the starters this this time around. 15 GBs with 12 turnovers. Plays as you would expect a monster to play, but with a lot more finesse and skill. One of the top recruits, wasn't he, I think, a top recruit in the country in his class as well. Um, Despite his size, though, one of the more athletic guys on the field, big brain, quality stick skills, and a cannon of a shot. He had at least a point in all but one game last year, started 15 of 16 games, I believe, on that first midfield line. Based on his upside and some fall action, like I said, it looks like he's going to eat that third attack spot and uh, will split time attacking from wings and X, probably playing a lot of two-man, I would think, with Schellenberger. And I think you'll see them bring a lot of midfielders down to play two-man with the attack. So I think you'd see maybe Connor come down, play a little bit of, little bit of two-man with shuts while you got Schellenberger up on the wing, things like that. But there will be a hell of a lot of two-man game, I think, involved in both Schellenberger and shuts between each other, as well as those two and uh, and midfielders that are coming down to play. 
So watch out for shuts. He's going to have a monster season for sure. Uh, next guy I want to talk about. Now, he struggled a little bit here over the course of 2022, but I was hot on Garno in 2021 and just didn't get a lot of burn, didn't finish the rock at all. Actually, I shouldn't even say. His stats would indicate he got less time or something like that, but the shot numbers wouldn't. But anyway, Garno I like because every team needs that guy out top that can just you know extend the defense with his shooting range. Garno's that dude. The dude has a cannon from out top. Sidearm, underhand, uh, overhand, it doesn't matter. This dude can unleash shots when he has time to step down. Uh, got more shots in 2021 and finished far more effectively. 2021, 22 goals, three helpers off 58 shots with 37.9% shooting. In 2022, seven goals, one helper, eight points off 45 shots with a 15.6% shooting percentage. So I'm not sure if it was he injured. Uh, did that affect the playing time? Did his shooting percentage being so poor maybe play into that playing time? I'm not sure what happened with that. Overall, I did watch a boatload of Virginia's games, but you know, you're really noticing the top six guys, the top five guys, and some of the other guys that kind of fill fill roles throughout. You you lose them in the shuffle overall. So I'll watch him closely here as, as spring approaches. Um, but he's gonna have to go back to smoking balls past goaltenders like he did in 2021 if he hopes to get himself some solid reps on that second midfield line. I don't I don't see him running with the first line overall. He could. You will see how things go, but uh, I think that he's definite depth on the second midfield and a quality midfielder, and I think that you might even see him, you know, depending on if he can't clean his shooting up, he might get bumped even further down that roster. Uh, let's see here. Who else we got? Another guy. This guy, once again, this is this is Virginia, Virginia kind of using the transfer portal to add insane quality depth in, in Thomas McConvey from Vermont. A goal hot. Uh, I can't even talk today. A goal hawk. Dude has a shot. Uh, he can shoot the ball lights out, and he has over the first three and a half years of his career. 2021, 37 goals, 16 helpers, 53 points off 101 shots, 36.6% shooting. In 2022, and you don't see this a whole lot when dudes have monster seasons, he improved the shooting percentage from 36 to 41.7, had 60 goals, 14 helpers, 74 points. Overall, seven man-up goals, 15 GBs. The dude is just a beast. Can straight up finish the rock. Excellent dodger from out top also. Can get in the mix. He, he's got a huge frame, and I even saw over, uh, I think it was Foy or somebody from inside the cross had mentioned when he was sitting out with Cormier and they were standing on the sideline together, he looks bigger than Cormier, partly because I think he's taller than Cormier, but the dude is just another beast, uh, another beast lefty specifically that they can have camping on that left side or high side with, with Cormier. So you can see they have Dodgers like Connor, like Schellenberger, like Schutz with dudes out top like McConvey, like Cormier, like Garno that can just straight up smoke balls past goalkeepers. Um, let's see here. Excellent in the two-man game. I watched a lot of Vermont lacrosse, and I watched a few clips of his coming into this podcast, and he plays really well in terms of just playing pick-slip. Two-man game can both be the dodger or the picker and the slipper in, in you know as part of that, and Virginia will do a lot of that with him, I expect. Uh, and I expect him to probably play a little bit off midfielders that are maybe dodging down the right alley with him kind of popping out and slipping underneath them back out to the top. We'll see how that works. But one thing is for sure, he is going to factor heavily. Uh, he was actually mentioned specifically because of his injury uh, by – Tiffany, uh, when Terry Foy talked to him over the weekend and talked about him and Cormier being out and how the lefties filled. So I expect him to be on that first midfield line, most likely playing, you know, one of those left spots over there, probably with Connor. And, you know, I'm not sure who will fill that, that next role, but we'll see, you know, as we talk about a few more guys, um, some other guys offensively, I've talked a lot about offense. Don't worry. We're going to get into the defense as well. Uh, some other guys that could factor offensively, I would say uh, Thomas Menke. I'm not sure how to pronounce that exactly. He started in that left attack spot in place of Cormier in the fall scrimmage. He didn't play at all in 2022, but he's a former number one, number seven overall pick, according to I, I, uh, Inside Lacrosse. So that's solid. Uh, Menke apparently played well and actually put up, I think, two or three points in that Lehigh scrimmage at least. Another guy. Number two on the IL Power 100, Truett Sunderland. He will definitely be getting some time, it looks like, at either the first or second midfield. Apparently played a lot of two-man game with Schellenberger out back and kind of on the, in that right corner of the field in that fall scrimmage. Um, so he's a little bit undersized. 
from what I understand. But in terms of just being able to play pick slip games with attackmen, they're just going to try to find ways to get him on the field, find a matchup and use him and his skill set to the advantage and an incredible offensive talent on a team that's crowded with offensive talent. Another guy you might see get a bunch of time. He got time last year. Evan Zinn, 13 points last year. Patrick McIntosh apparently filled in on that first midfield line for uh, McConvey, while McConvey was out in that scrimmage, he had 11 points last year. Both played in all 16 games and put up more points than even Garno, even though Garno took more shots than they did. They still were both more efficient and put up more points than Garno on the season. Now, that was offense. That was a boatload of crap that I just talked about, but you can see why I think offensively their top three or their top two as good as any in Cormier and and um, Schellenberger, but then you throw in midfielders like Connor, Dixon, all of these guys have a ton of experience. McConvey now, um, uh, you, you, you throw shuts down on attack now, you got it just a, two beast attackmen with one of the best attackmen, maybe the best attackmen in the country in Schellenberger. I mean, you can see why I like them offensively. Now, defensively, UVA, they were outside of the top 40 last year in terms of scoring, but they were 16th in terms of forced turnovers, and I've said this a lot about UVA style of defense. They play fast and they play loose. They go after you even where there's risk of getting beat. And they want to try to take your candy and get the ball upfield and transition whenever they possibly can. Which means they're extending. They're extending. They're going after ground balls and sometimes going after ground balls so effectively, uh, uh, aggressively, it hurts their positioning and it hurts that backside of the defense. They give up some easy goals. They tend to give up goals in spurts in that manner. But... They didn't really lose that much on the defensive side of the ball. And we will talk first here about Cole Kastner uh, on defense. UVA's resident takeaway guy slowly became one of UVA's most dependable cover guys by the end of 2022. He forced 32 turnovers in 2022, scored two goals, had three games with four or more turnovers, four against Towson and Cuse, five versus Hopkins, all back-to-back-to-back games, had two takeaways in each of UVA's final two games, two versus Brown in the NCAA first round, and two against Maryland in the quarters in that loss. So Cole Kastner, a veteran defender here, a year better, and potentially now one of the better cover guys and takeaway guys in college across. He's one reason to be optimistic about UVA on defense. The next guy, Cade Sawstead. Now, I think I think they said it was Sawstead was one of the guys that didn't play this past weekend. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, big rangy defender, team captain, and intense. He wants to guard every team's best attackman. 17 for- forced turnovers in 2022, and he had a helper. Brings confidence, fire, and more of a lead-by-example kind of attitude than anyone you're going to see on this defense overall. The guys, you know, from what I understand, a scrimmage hero, but a scrimmage hero in all of the best ways, making sure that everybody's going balls out all the time, both on the practice field and in games. I love that about him, and he's going to be one of the reasons, obviously, that this defense, I think, is going to improve their numbers between last year and this year. Another guy that I like, and I believe he was also out in the scrimmage here uh, against Lehigh earlier this year, Quentin Matsui. Not much flash out of Matsui overall, but he's a very good on-ball defender, knows the system well, will make sure everyone else is on the same page. 12 forced turnovers in 2022, and keeping up with this no flash, he had zero points on top of it and just a single shot overall. Uh, His MO, don't let this guy score. Get the ball back to the offense as soon as possible. It's just, hey, I'm going to play my role. I'm going to get the ball up the field and get the hell back on defense and wait to do it again. So I like Matsui. And I, I mean, those three on defense, I think, are three insanely solid poles to all have on the field at the same time. Now, transfer. Because, you know, like I said, they have done a good job in the transfer portal, adding depth where they need it. Griffin Kologi, transfer from Richmond, Kyle's brother. Um, he, he stepped in and filled, like I said, one of those starting roles for the polls. Started all but the first game of the year for, for Richmond last year as a freshman. Forced 21 cost turnovers last season. Picked up 20 GBs. Picked up a career-high 6 GBs and forced a turnover in Richmond's win over UVA on April 2nd of last year. He adds depth to an already solid group of long poles, and that's good news. And it's good news to see that he's already stepping in to a role backing up some of these poles. So we'll see him get on the field most likely in 2023. Grayson Solade, Virginia has a, a couple of really good short stick D mids. Solade being the best, very good on ball defender as a short stick, often drawing some pretty tough assignments because Virginia's schedule is so brutal. And he did a very good job neutralizing opposing teams' second option at the midfield, which is more often than not what he ended up covering. Ground ball hawk, hawk, hawk I can't say that today. 
ground ball hawk, mature, great communicator. He'll be a huge asset on UVA's defensive midfield in 2023. In 2022, he had 29 GBs, eight forced turnovers, and three helpers. The dude can get up the field in transition and is always looking to turn defense into offense, and they need more guys like that here. And and interesting to say, looks like Connor. Uh, instead of getting Connor off the field, I don't know how much this is going to play like this in the spring, but it, it, they made mention in the Inside Lacrosse article that made it sound like Connor wasn't straight coming off the field. It, it, maybe Virginia thought they were getting beaten transition too much last year, but they had Connor specifically getting back and playing defense, meaning if they were going to get a short stick midfielder stuck on the defensive side, or if they were going to get an offensive midfielder stuck on the defensive side, it was going to be Connor. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they do with him. Maybe he's going to see a bigger role, not necessarily playing defense regularly, but maybe maybe getting him a few more runs down there, maybe getting him some runs off the wing. Although I think Ware, isn't it Ben Ware? You guys can tell me that um, plays, plays a monster on the wing. Either way, Grayson Soliday. I'm starting to ramble like a moron. Grayson Soliday, huge at the short stick demon, will anchor that position group for, for Virginia. Scott Bauer and Ben Ware, both guys that you'll see chipping on defense, both of them getting a bunch of time last year, and you'll expect big things out of them as well. And then the keeper, the young keeper, Matthew Nunes. Oh, I forgot to change the screen for Soliday. You guys could have saw all these dope pictures of him D and, D and midfielders up. That would have been sweet. Uh, Matthew Nunes. Quick hands, solid footwork, enough talent to serve him well as he gets on with his sophomore campaign. 11-4 and four in cage for the Cavs as a freshman. Played a, a, just a brutal schedule overall. 49.8% uh, uh, between the pipes playing uh, in that high-powered ACC where you've got to play six games against ACC teams. That's just brutal. And... Uh, you know, overall, let's see here, considering that, that, that Virginia's defense wasn't one of the best and that they take a lot of chances and kind of lean on that goaltender to, to make sure that I, I think that Virginia is one of those defenses. If their keeper can make can stop 50 percent of shots, they're happy. I think you're going to see Noons bump up into the 51 to 53 percent range. I think if UVA is going to win a title, you have to see Noons get into that 51 to 54 percent range overall as a goalkeeper. I, I don't think you win a title with the, the style of defense they play if your goalkeeper's not saving 52% of his shots. So they're going to want to see him do that. But I think with a veteran defense in front of him, last year everybody was a year younger. I think with a veteran defense in front of him, you know, come come middle of the year, end of the year, I think they're going to be firing on all cylinders, and he'll probably see his save percentage at that point in the season between that 50 to 60% point. Very capable goalkeeper overall. And then certainly not – what, what should I say? Last but certainly not least is Petey motherfucking LaSala. Once again here, man, I'm just the, – the COVID year is screwing me up. I keep thinking dudes are gone only to be pleasantly surprised to find out that, hey, for some reason, even though I knew he was back, I've forgotten that he was back, and now he's back. Couldn't be more excited about Petey fucking LaSala, one of the premier face-off men in the country, one of my personal favorite players overall, a true offensive threat attacking the cage from the face-off dot in 2021. 10 goals, 7 helpers, 17 points as a face-off man, winning 62.4% at the dot. 2022, not nearly as proficient offensively. 8 goals, 2 helpers, 10 points, but won 63.3% of his chances at the dot. Now, I think he was a little less consistent because I think whereas in 2021, maybe he didn't get roached as often. He got roached in a couple of key matchups here. But, man, true All-American badass, one of my favorite players. If he stays healthy, he can take a great deal of pressure off that UVA defense and their offense being, I think, a more efficient team in this upcoming season. I think that's easily going to get UVA 10 regular season wins, assuming they play that same 14-game schedule. Now, let's get to fall action. So far, what we know, it's insanely tough to tell. They're not healthy. You're seeing a lot of these teams, they don't risk player health in the fall. If a dude's banged up in any manner, he's sitting. So like I said, Saladay was out in the fall scrimmage. Sawstead, Matsui were out. I believe it was Sawstead. It could have been uh, somebody else. I'm not sure. Uh, Kaloji ate up one of those starting spots on D, like I had said. But they were playing with an inexperienced group. Apparently, Noons looked solid, but you know the defense got put in a spin cycle, as they say, a little bit because they were young and shuffling guys that didn't have great experience in and out. Offensively, they were missing McCormier, McConvey, and others. Menke came in and played well, like I said. Um, and I forget the midfielder that I had talked about here. Who was it? Um... Let me see, and I will tell you. Oh, this is dead time here. Ah, screw it. We're not going to go through that. Um, but anyway, 
I think that it's hard to tell how they're going to be in the fall, and the fall doesn't matter as much in a team like UVA. They're just going to be trying to mix and match and get guys reps and runs and see who the guy – it's kind of like preseason NFL for teams like Maryland and UVA. Who's going to be our second midfield? How you know Who's going to be that fourth attackman, maybe even a fifth attackman? Get them time, get them reps, figure out if you have an injury, who's going to fill those roles. And I think that those questions were answered, and I think that's actually going to pay huge dividends for Virginia come spring is, is being forced to play some of the young guys and have some of the fourth and fifth options at both midfield and attack and defense get into games in the fall. That's going to be nothing but good for them down the road overall. And to be certain here, one of the keys here and why Maryland and Virginia and teams like this just are always good, it's because they're built different. They don't need to reload every year because their rosters are already so stacked overall. Both teams have masterfully worked the transfer portal to add depth at key positions where they didn't even necessarily need it, but knew that, hey, it's better to have this killer super senior who scored 50 points in this spot than this freshman who you know hasn't played really any games yet. So that's the key to to this team and to Maryland. You know why Maryland got so much better from 2021 to 2022, filling key spots with veteran killers to go with your already veteran killers. I don't know how that plays long term into the happiness. And we're almost you know we got a couple more years of dealing with the COVID shit here overall. But that's why these teams stay at the top of the pack. If their schedule makeup is similar to last season, I fully expect another maybe 5-1 and one record out of the ACC. Maybe if the ACC is a little tougher, maybe they go 4-2 and two in the ACC overall. But I think another 5-1 and one record in the ACC is reasonable. I don't think they're going to drop more than two or three non-conference matchups, even though they drop some early. Usually it's kind of an MO of Virginia's to lose a game they shouldn't lose in the first half of that season. Hot take? I think we could see a 12 and 2, maybe even a 13 and 1 UVA heading into the NCAA tournament. Last year heading into the NCAA tournament, if I did my math right, they were 11 and 3. Maybe that's not such a hot take. Maybe, you know, 12 and 2, 13 and 1 is pretty solid and maybe a lot of people will end up having that take, but I, you know, 13 and 1 I think is potential. 12 and 2 I feel like is a has a very high probability. I think that they win 12 games in the regular season here heading into the tournament. I think they'll get a bit better. I think that Schutz is actually going to fill that third attack role better than Matt Moore did. And I, I'm not calling Matt Moore their third attack. He may have been their second attack last year, but I think Schutz coming into the picture, I think he's going to gel insanely well with the other two attackmen. So I think that you're actually going to have a better attack group out of Virginia this year. I think their midfield a little bit has added depth with youngsters, and they have a really good core of returning guys coming back. All team first guys that don't care about their numbers nearly as much as they care about playing well, holding their teammates up and getting that W. So I think they're going to be better at both of those positions, better at the faceoff dot. They've got monsters on the wing. I think defensively, your goalie's no longer a green freshman. Now you've got a sophomore coming back with NCAA experience with an NCAA a tournament win under his belt has already gone through the gauntlet of the ACC so I don't necessarily think they're like leaps and bounds better at every position but I think they're certainly as good overall at every position as they were last year and I think they're going to have a little bit more team chemistry because now we've got the, a core group of guys that came up together now all playing together and leading this team so that is what I think is going to be interesting to watch. That is why I like Virginia to both make the Final Four, and I'm pretty much going out on a limb and saying I'm picking Virginia to be the NCAA champion in 2023. I'm going to go out and say that they're my favorite right now. And uh, that is it. As always, be sure to like, subscribe. Hit that notification bell. Share this if you appreciated this content with everybody that you can. Let's get as many people paying attention heading into the season because whereas I think I did crappy last year, you'll see the content this year. I'm going to be, I'm not going to put a podcast out unless it is well written and well thought out and I have a whole lot of intelligent shit to say. Even if a lot of it's obvious, if you're a Virginia fan, none of this came as, as a surprise to you. Uh, you knew all the guys that I was going to talk about. You knew about the transfers. You knew about the youngsters that were going to get time. So yeah, for the Virginia fans, this may have just been me stating the obvious, but for anybody else, I hope that this was solid, maybe brought up some guys that you weren't familiar with and so on and so forth. So I will be back next weekend to do the same shit again. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And Hoost is out. The Last Factor Podcast.